number 50 in our local dialect. Ahim number 50. Wa yi o ye so di ri ya o ba da yi no di sa fa o po lo mo se me tu o de la di le o di la di le o te lo te lo na di pe a da do ya fu di la di le da fo ka di so yi ba
How shall we sing the Lord's song in a place? Let my right hand forget our time. If I do not remember this, let my song praise to the Lord of my feet. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my feet, John, remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who say, Rise, eat the rise, eat, and it will be foundation there. Eight, four daughters of Bethlehem, who are to be filled with God. And they shall all hear this, that you are dead, three as four, as this as. Nine, and they shall all hear this, that take it, and then it, by little one, against the stone. Amen. Amen. Nimbo number love. Fifty-eight. Nimbo number fifty-eight. Brother Colin.
and start preaching. Brother Felix. To God be all the glory and honor, brother Ken. Now pick the microphone and start preaching whatever the Lord has set forth in your heart. Behold, the house is in waiting, so that the Lord is to preach his heart to his own event. Let's take our Bibles and look once again in First Peter chapter 2, and my text today is from verse 21 down to verse 25, and I want to speak with you about Christ, our great example. That's taken from verse 21, where Peter writes, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Pedro amalankula za uh, kukala chitazo ndipo amafoto kwa zilabu ino munga yesu wato kumana ni mavudo ni manzunzo utokole laso amene kila kukala chitazo uliwena azite nkila iwo Now having said that, it's important to understand each scripture in its context We've all seen those little religious bracelets that people wear where it says WWJD. In other words, what would Jesus do? And they live their lives trying to follow Christ's example as far as living out a life of holiness, but that's not what this means. It is utterly impossible for any sinner to look at Christ's life and determine that they're going to follow his example and somehow earn their salvation or maintain it. The context here is in that just as Christ suffered, because of who he is and what he came to accomplish to satisfy God's law and justice on behalf of those sinners that the Father gave him, so any that he has redeemed and called to himself can expect to suffer at the hands of religious people in our day who are antichrist and who will not have him to have all the glory. There is a belief today by popular preachers who say that if you trust in the Lord Jesus, and I'm putting that in quotes because they don't worship the same Christ we do, but their message is if you trust in Jesus, then all will be well. All of your problems will be taken away.
they preach a Jesus of health, wealth, and prosperity. Yes, I mean, I'm a little old. Yes, who was him because what will you marry him? Bambanim or is this when the rain is but as you study Christ's message and you study that of the apostles that he called to himself and sent out, it is just the opposite, that to preach the Lord Jesus Christ as he set forth in Scripture is going to bring persecution. It's going to bring opposition. It's going to bring isolation from the world. <laughs> The Christ of Scripture, as he's revealed in the Scriptures, is not a popular Jesus. In fact, everything about him goes completely contrary to this flesh. Yes, one Maleba, Nduo Siena Kutani, Indiesu, Amenetikola Pasini Malarikira. Yes, when you went one Maleba, Agalarikidua, Atu, Ama Sempana, Amalekana, Sama Grizana, Mavuto Ama Tsuka. Omayesua could see for you, Nduo Grizan, it's at once a mot, as a Grizana, as a Sangala, and Ama Karidaba mot, Simsin too. Our Lord told his disciples before he went to the cross in John. 16 that in verse 2 he said they shall put you out of the synagogues yea the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth god service <laughs> And notice he says, and these things will they do, not perhaps they will do, these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father nor me. These are unconverted people that oppose the Christ of Scripture. People will ask, well, what is the offense? They try to preach a Jesus that everybody can like and everybody can want to follow, but that's not the Christ of Scripture. Yes, when you want Malemba, see, so I mean, and was a cause of Umsadira, Kabena Kumfuna, Kabena Kumlondola, I. Back here in 1 Peter chapter 2, when we read in verse 21, For even here unto were ye called, you have to go back up to the verse previous. When Peter is describing the suffering that those that are the Lord's can expect to endure, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently, but if when ye do well, and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, for this is acceptable with God. Our Lord told the disciples that they would be cast out of the synagogues. Well, that represents congregations today. And I'm speaking with many of you, if not all of you, that at one time attended these places of worship and even perhaps presided over them and preached for them. And now, because of Christ being revealed in you, you have been cast out. There's been a separation. That's to be expected because we don't preach the same Jesus. We don't preach the same gospel. 
They have a Jesus of their own making, of their own imagination. But the Christ Jesus that we now serve and worship is one who is over all and to be glorified above all. You notice here in verse 21 of 1 Peter 2 that it's all connected to Christ's suffering. That's what this is about. When we say we preach Christ and him crucified, what sets us apart from all other religious and worldly people is who Christ is and why he died and what he accomplished in his death, and for whom he died. That's all the issue, and that's where the opposition arises. The world has a Jesus who came and wants to save everybody. And so that's why they say he laid down his life to try to save everybody. But that's not the Christ of Scripture. In fact, when it says here, because Christ also suffered for us, he endured the contradiction of sinners against himself because he, the, the world would not have him to reign over them. They weren't looking for that type of Jesus. And therein is the offense because they would have a Jesus who would offer himself to save everybody, but that's not why he came. He came to save specifically by his death those that the Father gave him, chosen from eternity. And therein, people object. They say, no, that's not our Jesus. Yes, <laughs> The world says he died to leave us an example, but not in the sense that we see here in Scripture. They believe that he died, but now it's up to us to make his death effectual. That's not the Christ of Scripture. <laughs> he didn't die as a martyr would die, and now the followers try to keep his legend or legacy going. That's not why he died. <laughs> he died as the substitute in the place of those sinners that the Father gave him from all eternity. <laughs> He died to fully satisfy God's law and justice. He didn't die to leave the rest up to us to follow.
He died to actually make reconciliation for sin so that those for whom he died are reconciled once for all forever to God. But the world preaches a Jesus who did everything he could, but now we have to believe on this Jesus in order to be reconciled to God. But the Christ of Scripture leaves nothing to man, and that really is ultimately the reason why people oppose this Christ of Scriptures, because man wants to have part of the glory, but there's no glory left to man. It's all given to the Lord Jesus Christ. So his suffering for his people accomplished their salvation, but the part in verse 21 that says, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, it's talking about the fact that we can expect, just as our Lord Jesus Christ was hated without cause, we can expect to be hated without cause. And so how we need the Spirit of God the same spirit that called us to Christ, we need him to keep us in the example of Christ, of how our Lord exercised grace and humility in the face of all kinds of opposition. We need that same grace. <laughs> But verse 22 shows us just how effectual was the suffering of Christ, and herein is our hope. It says, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. None of us could ever follow his example in that regard, because we're sinners by nature. But here it says, he did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He was in the likeness of sinful flesh. In other words, he looked like all those around him who were sinners, and yet he did no sin. He was without sin, always was, always will be. Uh, he was even born of a sinful woman. A lot of people like to pretend that somehow Mary, his mother, must have been preserved from sin in order to bring him into this world, but such was not the case. That seed in her womb was not of her, nor of man, but of God. So, being born of a sinful woman, and yet 
did no sin, had no sin, never knew it, never experienced it. He kept company with sinful men. In fact, that's why they counted him a sinner, because they said, well, he's a friend of sinners. Well, thankfully so, because that's who he came to save. And yet, in all that, he did no sin. He was without sin. Isaiah called him the man of sorrows, in other words, greatly afflicted and ultimately put to death by men, considering him to be a sinner. But the clear revelation is he did no sin. He did not die as a sinner. He died as the substitute for sinners, for those that the Father gave him. When he died for the sins of his people, those that God had chosen and given him from eternity, it did not make him a sinner. The sin of his people was laid upon him, but in no way was he ever tainted by their sin. He had no sin in his nature when he was born. He did no sin throughout his life. And on the cross, he was that perfect substitute without sin. That's why when people say, well, we just need to follow in Jesus' footsteps. Well, we're all sinners by nature. So even from our birth, we are condemned, but not Christ. That's why he came in this world to be that sin bearer who did no sin in order that he might satisfy God's law and justice on their behalf. But here again is why we make this particular point in that when it says there in verse 21, leaving us an example, it's not an example of how to live a life without sin. None of us could do that. But the example is in how he suffered and what he endured. And by God's grace, the Father upheld him by his spirit in order that he accomplish that salvation on behalf of sinners such as we are. <laughs> But the example that we are given to follow is in his patience, in that here it says, when he was reviled, verse 23, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. That's the example that we're called upon to follow by God's grace.
When it says there in verse 22, neither was guile found in his mouth, it's speaking there that there was never any deceit in his lips. There was no falsehood in what he taught or in his doctrine. Everything that he represented was the truth because he is the truth. Here we see how Christ was not only that perfect example, but that perfect substitute in that there was no part of his life or his thoughts or even of his words. When it says neither was guile found in his mouth, it's in this that he is our substitute because even for that he fulfilled the law on behalf of such sinners as we are. If we are one of these for whom Christ paid the debt, that the Father gave him to come and pay the sin debt. This causes us to bow in humble adoration, to think about what he endured on our behalf, and that it was our sins that were laid to him, because none of us has any truth in us. We're nothing but deceit and falsehood. But he, it says, there was no sin in him, no sin in, in his lips, no guile found in his Mouth. Yeah, but it's his very example that gives us strength as we face opposition over following him and declaring him. When the world stands opposed to him, they stand opposed to us. But here's the reason given that we, by God's grace, should stand and not faint, to bear up under such suffering, even as Christ did. Indeedo. In whatever men find for reason to accuse us and to persecute us, we understand that we deserve every bit of contradiction because we know ourselves to be sinners but our hope is in him who came and worked out that salvation on our behalf in spite of all that the world threw against him the example that we have to follow here is that when he was reviled, he reviled not again. We pray for grace, not to answer when men would revile us for Christ's sake. What he endured was on our behalf, and therefore when we're reviled, we're, we're not reviling again those that would attack us. When he suffered, we're, we're not threatening back those that would, would threaten us. 
But as it says there, he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. In other words, we bow to God's will in all things. Think for just a minute how he was reproached. They repro reproached him as a glutton, as a wine bibber, as a friend of publicans and sinners. But the only reply that he made was simply that wisdom is justified of her children. In other words, he is that wisdom of God, and by his life and death, he would be justified, in other words, in saving his children, those very sinners that the world reproached him for being their friend, in the end, they would be saved. When he was charged with casting out demons and doing so by the prince of devils, Beelzebub, he did not defend himself other than with strong reasonings, in other words, to show that if he were truly working for the Prince of Devils, that the Prince of Devils would not be casting out his own. So he would reason with them only so far and then leave them to themselves. <laughs> I will tell you that when reviled and when threatened, our best defense is nothing but either no answer at all, or if we do answer, it be simply the word of God, that we respond simply by the word of God and leave it alone. We're not going to convince sinners, unconverted sinners, against their will. It takes the work of the Spirit of grace, and that he will do without us having reason with sinners. <laughs> When he was called a Samaritan and they said he had a devil, his only answer was that he didn't and that his one purpose was to honor his father and that they were the ones who were dishonoring him. <laughs> So this is the example of which Peter says we are to follow here when he was reviled on the cross by those that passed by and really by the chief priests and the scribes, the religious leaders of the day and the thieves that were crucified with him and mocked him, he opened not his mouth in any way. Yeah, you ought to Sada Yanke Adam Chida Jipongwe, 
kuti akati uze ife uli siti masuwe kaso kuyanka uwe na akati lankula mawachi pongwe chon mfeka nchakuri yeyo adasun sika chupajapanchimo watu nipo choli nga chosu ziki ila nkuta aga kareji tanzo chaife atu miki ama so here's where we pray for grace because the Lord Jesus himself told his disciples that they would be hated by the world even as he was hated without cause. But so be it. We know that the persuasion that the Lord has given us of his son and that our salvation is entirely in him, we're not going to renounce him to follow the world. Abarum Pabele Tiswegam Simwa Jisomo Kuti Uri Tandi Zire Uti Yeo Bozun Sika Sare Zusika Jifoja Iye O Jifoja Rere Ade Om Tuma Ifen So Pabele Tisun Sika Pulari Kila Otek Na Nurumi Kila Nchitwe Mene Eyi Tikarina Kwa Kulimba Mchima Bozua Kuti Iti Sisu Kuchitika Jifoja Ife Kwa Jifoja Rere Wa Atu Verse 23 The last part it says He committed himself To him that judgeth Righteously here and again is the example that he's given us to follow, that we're the Lord's, and he is the one that has chosen us by his grace and given us to his son and for whom his son paid the debt. So when reviled and when threatened, what do we do? We commend ourselves unto the very same God and Father who is the judge of all the earth, knowing that better to endure the judgment of men than the judgment of God. The glorious truth is that if Christ paid our sin debt, when he committed himself to his Father, we were in him. It was on our behalf that he did so. And therefore, we stand justified and reconciled in him. And the world can never undo that. So again, our example or the example of Christ that we're to follow in patient enduring is all founded upon who he is and what he accomplished there at the cross. This whole portion is showing us how it is that Christ has been pleased to save such sinners as we are, and therefore we rest in him, regardless of the revilings of this world. <laughs> In verse 24, when it says, Who his own self bear our sins. This is typified in that high priest in the Old Testament that went in before the Lord on that day of atonement and not without blood and that blood was put upon the altar when he went in he went in bearing the sins of the people of israel and when he went in he went in on their behalf you see that's what substitution is bearing those iniquities of all that people that the father had given him the lord had given him and therein is our rest when the world opposes, we know that he has borne away our sin, and there is therefore now no condemnation. 
The idea there of bearing our sins is to take them up. That's why he came to be the substitute, not just in his life, but all the way to the cross when it says in his own body on the tree. He bore up those sins and was offered up as the sacrifice for those sins before the Father, yet being without sin himself. He was the sin bearer. He bore them away. When it says he bore them in his own body on the tree, so satisfactory was the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on behalf of those sinners for whom he died that he made a full end of them. There is no sin, not one that remains that stands against any one that the Lord Jesus Christ has redeemed. So in light of that, let the world say what it will, but in Christ we stand justified before God. <laughs> Now, when it says there in verse 24 that we being dead to sins, it doesn't mean that we're no longer sinners, but we're dead to sin's condemnation. When Christ died, he put it away, and therefore there is now no sin that can ever stand against one of God's children because of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So complete was the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death and putting away the sins of his people that now it says they should live unto righteousness. In other words, live unto that justice of God that Christ is satisfied and live in peace, knowing that Christ has paid the sin debt. It says there, by whose stripes ye were healed. We have no righteousness of our own. So to live unto righteousness is to live unto that righteousness that the Lord Jesus Christ earned and established and God imputed once for all the account of his elect. It's under that justice, under that righteousness that we live, knowing that Christ has already put away our sin. Notice, how Peter put it, by whose stripes ye were healed. That's in the tense of that we were healed when Christ died and we continue to enjoy that healing, even though we're sinners. Yet that effect 
in no way undo what Christ has accomplished for our justification. We're saved forever by his death. You see, the world continues to pursue a righteousness. They presume that by their works and their will, they can earn or maintain their salvation, but they do so to their own demise. So this is why we take no thought as to the world's opposition to us who are Christ, because what we have in him is full, complete, forever justification before God and reconciliation and pardon, and peace. So verse 25 sums it all up as to who it is that not only has saved us, but who it is that keeps us. Because we were as sheep going astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. That's our nature. But look it, are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. In other words, that's Christ's work to do, to call us to himself, everyone for whom he paid the debt, and keep us in himself. Oh, how precious those titles of Christ, both shepherd and bishop of our souls. He's the shepherd and that he suffered and died on behalf of his sheep. And now he ever lives to feed them and to care for them and to keep them. In Scripture, the Lord Jesus is called the Good Shepherd, He's called the Great Shepherd, and He's called the Chief Shepherd. In other words, all the glory belongs unto Him. That word shepherd actually is the word pastor. And then you have the word bishop. Pastors and overseers is what that word means. But any that the Lord has placed among his flock to direct them by the word, such as we are as preachers, yet we are so undeserving of those titles because he is the chief shepherd. He is the capital B bishop, overseer of the souls of his people. He's the one that saves and keeps his own. <laughs> And 
And here's a final word of exhortation since we're all preachers gathered here specifically today that as regards the work of a preacher or a pastor, what I like to call an under shepherd because he is the chief shepherd, we're reminded that all the work that we are doing is really the Lord Jesus Christ's work. It's not our work. All the sheep that we have to shepherd, let's never forget, they are Christ's sheep. They're not ours. The souls over which he has made us to be overseers, they're souls that he has bought with his own precious blood. They're not ours, they're his. The spiritual house that he has built is his habitation. It's not ours, it's his. And it's not our church but it's his and therefore the instruction he's given us is simply to feed his sheep but to identify with the lord jesus christ as he is in scripture and to give him all the glory in our generation is going to bring suffering and opposition we can expect it but here's one final exhortation that would leave us, and that's found in Philippians chapter 1 and verses 27 down to verse 29. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 27 down to verse 29. Paul says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Verse 27, he says here in verse 28, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. In other words, when they oppose you, they oppose Christ. It shows their loss, but to you of salvation and that of God. In other words, it's because Christ has saved you that they oppose you. But 
But look at verse 29. This is the key verse. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. You see what it's saying there? That it's the same grace of God that caused us to believe on Christ that sustains us in the face of suffering. We're going to suffer for his sake, but by the grace of God, we stand. So let our eyes, by his grace, be on Christ alone, and in no way, as it says there, terrified by our adversaries. May the Lord keep us. May the Lord continue to cause us to stand in this generation to declare Christ in all his glory. I am going to turn that back to you. And may the Lord bless each of you as you return to your respective places to prepare to preach again this weekend. To God be all the glory and honor, Brother Ken, for sure. He is the good shepherd. He is the high priest. Him alone is worthy to be blessed. He is the chief shepherd. Amen. Him number 30 speaks about Christ, the good shepherd. Nimbo number 30. Yehova Musa Wangadi Ilibe Ilibe Kuso Andi Kone Saini Netabwinoli
Wazoza mafuta mafuta o o ma o matata matata di o changa di se o koma be e chi se o o Gracious Father, I thank you for this time in your word, and I pray that you would indeed strengthen each of us that you have raised up to preach the glorious person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would be unmoved by the world's smiles or the world's frown, knowing that we are yours and yours to do with as you will, but in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we could have no better 
standing in this world than to be in him, to be bought by him, justified by his precious blood, and living out our days to your honor and glory. I pray for each of these that you have gathered as preachers there in Malawi, that you would strengthen each one in their respective places where you have placed them. And we know that if you have raised them up, it is because you have your sheep that you will call out for whom Christ has paid the debt. And you'll do it through the glorious gospel of your blessed son. So I commend each of these to you. Pray for traveling mercies as each one goes back. And thank you, dear Father, for this fellowship that you enable us to enjoy in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And to him be all the honor and glory alone and all the praise for all of his great work on our behalf. And we give you thanks in his precious name. Amen. Amen.